Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, pacers, chasers, and snail racers, welcome along to the Joe Spivey YouTube channel, where we discuss books and little else. And uh, I do indeed have a random review for you today, folks, but just, in, uh, just before that, um, I have just uh, detached myself from a YouTube video um, in which Jordan Peterson tried his best to make Elon Musk look, sound, and seem rather intelligent, um, but of course that, that, that never quite came to be. It's absolute catnip for me, those types of videos. I cannot help but watch them. Um, and this one featured um, Elon Musk and Jordan Peterson talking about the ravaging, sort of marauding antenatal movement, supposedly, which is supposedly stalking the lands in America and Britain and Europe, because um, you've heard that, haven't you? You've heard about the antenatal, the antenatal movement. There have been scores of protests um, soiling some of the soil in, uh, you know, your town centres. No, you haven't, because it's not a movement. But they thought of, they 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 thought that it was pertinent to pontificate about it for ten and fifteen minutes, not realizing, of course, that the reason people aren't having children is because of cost of living crises and because. Um, my generation and the one uh, just slightly above and the one just slightly below will be the first, really, in the post-industrial era to be materially, um, you know, monetarily, financially, economically worse off than their uh, forebears. And so having a child is very, very expensive indeed. It's not some leftist reaugmentation of the world. And it's, it's not, you know, uh, university professors buggering around with our psychology telling us that having children is, is a, you know, a kind of uh, pollution of the earth in, in some uh, uh, in, in some sort of, you know, Victorian scientific way. Uh, it's because we, we can't afford to have them. Um, it would cost, you know, eight, nine hundred, you know, eight, nine hundred pounds a month to have a child. And most people don't have that um, to sort of factor into their expenditure. Um, and if Mr. Musk could uh, hand over uh, a little more of his hundreds of millions, then we might be in a, a better place, glo both globally and nationally. And, and he goes on about his... Um, philosophical edification, talking about his reading of Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. So much effort has gone into proving that this, uh, you know, this South African bully billionaire is um, indeed an intelligent human being, even though a 10 or 15 minute conversation with him disproves that egregiously. But um, yeah, I, I thought I'd wax lyrical about that. Whenever I uh, see a video of Elon Musk, my uh, estimations of him are lowered. Uh, and I thought I'd, I thought I'd report that to my, to my YouTube community. But we do indeed have a book to discuss today. Um, we are talking about Will Self's Quantity Theory of Insanity. Um, this was his first collection of published words, which came out in uh, 1991, first published by Bloomsbury, which is, uh, which, who are the people behind this fancy newfangled edition. And um, yeah, a little bit of background about Mr. Self. He is, um, you know, chief among his achievements are his um, in introducing me to the gorgeous world of literature, um, whilst I was bored by uh, goodness knows who, uh, 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 Thomas Hardy and Sylvia Plath and, you know, all of the, uh, uh, you know, titular classics that are, um, are, are sort of wrist uh, whipping teachers were, were were getting us to read at school. Um, he was the person that, that kind of sexed everything up and excited things for me, along with a you know an, a, a kind of a barge load of other late twentieth century writers, Martin Amis, bits of Ian e. McEwan, and you know the others therein. Um, and so that, that that that's his prime achievement. Without selves, panache and pizzazz and. Um, you know, writerly confidence and the way in which he, he grabs the attention. Um, I may not well have been, been sitting here pontificating about books to this to this camera. Um, so that's that's his, you know, his uh, chief achievement as far as I'm concerned. He, um, besides his literary exploits, is or was rather in the late 90s and early noughties a um, a regular uh, appearer, a regular um, a panelist on 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 national panel shows, and um, he he cut a rather sort of lugubrious, gloomy, sort of iconoclastic figure, a great uh, a great serviceman of the counterculture. Um, he would often say some 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 uh, what nowadays would be regarded as perfectly serviceable phrases, but back then were were rather recherche and shocking. Um, and he's he's. I, I hear he's about six foot plenty. He's, you know, six foot seven or something uh, ridiculous like that. He's got a vertical aptitude. And um, so, yeah, he kind of, you know, he sort of 
staggers about London um, above, you know, looking at everybody's crowns on the top of their heads. And um, yeah, this is his first short story collection. And um, yeah, much of his early work can be um, can be defined as a, a, a very, 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 um, a very weird exploration. Um, he's obsessed with with um, psychoses and insanity. Of course, it's called the Quantity Theory of Insanity, which is the, the title of one of the stories in here. Um, yeah, he's in, he's obsessed with, or, or, or at least shows a keen interest in aberrant behaviour. Um, so, so he would very, he, he, in fact, to my knowledge, has never started a story about a um, a thirty four year old bank clerk with two point two children living in Godalming. That is not his ground. He would much rather talk about a uh, a kind of wispy vagrant who has, you know, he's had two uh, two of his vertebral columns removed and is um, an addict, is, is, is addi addicted to alcohol and to, you know, consuming printers or something like that. It's 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 the absurd, the bizarre, the unspoken that, that, that he focuses on. And that's that's um, one of the, 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 the central bits of, of or one of the takeaways of this short story collection. The first one is actually one of my favourites, actually. It's, it's the shortest, I think. Um, um, it is called uh, the North London Book of the Dead, and um, it, it, it posits a, uh, a reality in which um, those who pass do not indeed kind of, you know, uh, rot in the ground. They do not, um, you know, they do not reside on our mantelpieces in urns. Um, they do not, they're, they're not swept out to sea, um, like like Boromir, for example. They are, they, they are relocated, phenomenologically relocated to a different part of London or or the nearest available metropolis. Um, and they, they go about their lives in much the same way as they did when they were, when they were living, when they were, as it were, when their hearts were beating and they were breathing. Um, and yeah, this happens to the, the, the central protagonist, um, I don't think he's ever named, um, but, but he um, cremates his mother along with his brother um, and then uh, um, finds it plausible that his mother could walk back into the room at any moment. That that's one of the um, one of the very damaging aspects of his grief is that he it, it, a lack of acceptance that that um, you know his mother could emerge like a like a a flapping gull through the window at any minute and come back into his life. Um, and that does indeed happen. Um, and one of the, the first section that I want to read out from the North London Book of the Dead is um, the bizarre way in which uh, Will focuses on the shock of the protagonist. Um, but but it, it, it's not a shock about the, it, the... Obviously, there's an initial shock when you see your post, what, what has to be a posthumous motherly figure in the street. Um, but, but later on, it is not really her newfound existence that, that, that most... Uh, appalls and amazes the the central character. It's her new character. It's her new characteristics. The fact that um, it's said many times he, she's living in Crouch End, which is um, I think a little bit of an austerized uh, area of London, and um, it was it was an area and uh, a, a, a set of inhabitants and a polity that. Um, the mother would have criticised when she was alive, but now she is um, she is very, very willing to live at Crouch End. Why are you living at Crouch End, mother? You don't even like Crouch End. Um, so that's, that's yeah, the idea that you've got a, um, a rebirthed, undead mother before you and um, the kind of most examinable and the, uh, you know, the most special characteristic about her is her new personality. That's obviously a strange thing to look at, but this is, this is a section that I, that I wanted to highlight. Um, so he's, he's just met her in the street and she's, um, yeah, she's not amazed by it. She, she doesn't expect the sun to be, um, completely bamboozled by a reincarnation. Um, she just, she just carries on regardless. Um, mother wasn't phased. She looks at her watch, another crappy Timex, indistinguishable from the last one I'd seen her wearing. So she does carry over some of the, um, you know, some of those just those, those regular appurtenances of life. Um, it's late. This is the, the the mother talking. It's late. I've got to go to my class. If you want to know about life and death, uh, come and see me tomorrow. I'm living at 24 Rosemount Avenue in the basement flat. We'll have tea. I'll make you some cookies. And with that, she gave me the sort of perfunctory peck on the cheek she always used to give me when she was in a hurry and toddled off up to Crouch Hill, leaving me standing bemused. What I couldn't take was that Mother was so offhand about life and death. 
rather than the fact of it. That and this business of living in Crouch End. Mother had always been such a crushing snob about where people lived in London. Certain suburbs, such as Crouch End, were so incredibly non-you in Mother's book of form. The revelation that there was life after death seemed to me relatively unimportant, set beside Mother's startling new attitude. So that's obviously a very, very nice take, and the blasé in which um, both the writer and the protagonist deal with, you know, the greatest secret of life. How many books, how many religions have spurned as a result of our ignorance, you know, as, as, as we sort of, we, we, we crest that precipice, or we, we, yeah, we crest that, um, we crest that, uh, uh, that mortal hill. Um, this book seems to have all the answers, and yet that's not really, that doesn't seem really to be the point of the exercise. Next up, we have a, a story called Ward 9, um, which allows a, um, a sort of an artist, he's, he's a, he's, um, a sort of a, a, an artistic therapist who goes into a, um, a ward of psychomaniacs, and um, is enlisted by the um, by the, the, the kind of resident patron or not patron the the, the um, yeah the, the resident uh, manager and yeah psychological uh, individual in charge Zach Busner uh, is employed by him uh, to uh, sort of distract them and, and soothe the 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 um, the inhabitants and the some of the some of the customers I suppose we should call them at this place um, the idea that, that that you can yeah soothe and palliate some of their um, their, their insane characteristics by having them work communally on, on a bit of art or, you know, squeezing out some paint tubes and, you know, es essentially just using it as, as some of us do, as a, as a cathartic release from the constraints of modern existence. Um, but yeah, this is talking about uh, the insanity of some of the, um, yeah, some of the bed dwellers. Um, but on Ward 9, insanity had proved a great leveller. A refugee sometimes seems to have no class. The English depend on class, to the extent that whenever two English people meet, they spend nanoseconds in high-speed calculation. Every nuance of accent, every detail of apparel, every implication of vocabulary is analysed to produce the final formula. This in turn provides the coordinates that will locate the individual and determine the attitude. The patients on Ward 9 had distanced themselves from this. They could not be gauged in such a fashion. Instead, I divided them up mentally into the following groups. Thinny pukies, junkies, sads, skitsies, and maniacs. The first four groups were all represented about equally, whilst the fifth group was definitely in the ascendant. There were lots of maniacs on Ward 9, and by maniacs I mean the culturally popular homicidal maniac. Uh, sorry, not the culturally popular homicidal maniac, but his distant herbivorous cousin. Hyper rather than homicidal, and manic rather than maniacal. Now, I don't really know the difference between manic and maniacal. I use them interchangeably, so I clearly need to <coughs> consult my well-thumbed dictionary. But you see there how self uses insanity as a way of, um, you know, uh, 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 operate <coughs> operating a, a cultural critique, um, auditing a cultural critique, the way that, um, you know, the idea that... Um, my plum-throated accent and, you know, my wearing a kind of spangled shirt now somehow makes me a uh, member of the, um, the, the the societal bourgeoisie or whatever. Uh, is, is obviously lambasted and lampooned in here. And, um, yeah, he's obviously needling uh, uh, classification. So you can see, although he's rather aloof, although he's rather distant, although, you know, self can often be, be, be photographed with, you know, cigarette in his hand and sort of you know, looking off into the future, um, very, very non nonchalant and uncaring, you can see that, that he really does want to sort of reach out and make readers think, which is obviously a little bit of a banal way of going about describing his work, but, but um, nonetheless a good thing. Uh, next up we have, I think, probably the best, um, the best uh, explanation of insanity, or at least the best rehashing of it. Um, he calls insane people um, those immersed in their own projects, and obviously they are immersed in their own projects when they're doodling or when they're, you know, uh, creating, he has lots of people create um, uh, uh, soil edifices um, as a way of, you know, as a way of relieving themselves of their insanity. But this is, this is a section. Um, in the afternoon, this is the, the artistic therapist. In the afternoon, I got the patients who turned up to try and do something with the worksheets. Some of them were interested. Some were immersed in their own projects. Clive turned out to be a surprisingly effective group leader. He dragooned three rather sheepish depressives into snaking wet trails of pain up and down the large gridded sheet. Their regular actions formed swirl after swirl 
He stood back and surveyed them at work like some sort of gaffer. Looking at Clive, his jaw working, rocking as ever, I remembered that he was meant to have been discharged today. I wondered why he was still on the ward, but his pop eyes, his shiny elbow pads dissuaded me from asking. And you can see that, yeah, immersed in their own projects. So, so it's a really, really, really great way of, of simply saying that perhaps, and, and you, se you sense this is the central, not thesis, but it's it's what uh, self is nudging at us all the time, that, that psychoses of... of, of many, 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 um, you know, sort of gradually uh, progressive orders um, of magnitude are essentially just different planes of existence. I know that that sounds very, very almost not nimbious, but it, it sounds rather sort of limp-wristed and tree-hugging and, and very, very progressive capital P. Um, but it, but it, it may well be true, folks. Um, as somebody who is um, sort of almost dogmatically sober these days, um, I like to think that the, 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 the current level of reality and somebody that's never taken mind-altering LSD or whatever, um, I'd like to think that the level that, on which I'm operating now is perhaps the optimal one, but, but we'll part that for a moment. Um, he's clearly saying that the insane are just, um, that, that they're sort of on the same road, but they're just in a different car or whatever. Um, and you can, you, hopefully anyway, from there, you've got a little bit of a sense of the style, um, selfie and style, which, which, um, which comes at you like a garden rate, which thwacks you in the face the moment you encounter it. Um, it is a sort of... Um, it's not really, I don't know really how to describe it. It's, it's, it's almost chromatically different. It's, it's, it's almost, it's a different lens of looking at the world is Will Self. And that's what, that's what style is, isn't it? Um, you're trying to convey very, very similar ideas, perhaps to your fellow writers, but you're doing it not in a different medium, but at a different pace, at a different tenderness, at a different texture is what I'm trying to say without being too, um, without being too nebulous and artsy fartsy. Um, and then the, 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 the final section that I want to highlight is, um, the story that gives, the story that gives the collection its name, The Quantity Theory of Insanity, um, which is, yeah, a, a, a psychological discovery by another um, of the of the, the, the central narrators. Um, this is of the, what is it, the third or, sorry, the fourth story in here. Um, and it imagines and eventually proves that there is a set, of, as, as you'd imagine from like the quantity theory of money, there is a set amount of insanity to go around, to be um, societally distributed and um, efforts to sort of diminish and palliate and treat insanity within one discrete column of society um, is not so much erroneous, but it will have a, a knock on effect um, to the next, uh, uh, to, you know, to the next uh, room or the next city or the next country. So if everybody is mad on uh, uh, 21 Crawforth Avenue and you go in and treat everybody on 21 Crawforth Avenue, then uh, people on 23 Crawforth Avenue next door will suddenly begin to exhibit traits of madness. That's what it's talking about. It's, it's, he describes it, he metaphorizes it as a mattress um, or, or rather one of those, um, I would imagine it as one of those um, amusement games where you smack a rabbit on the head and as soon as one goes down, the other comes up and you, as soon as you press something down, it goes up or, or when you're um, trying to stop the flow of a leaking hose pipe and all of a sudden you, you, you crush something down there and of course the water pressure just balloons it up later on um, down the line. Um, and that, that, that's what it talks about. It, this is the, the epiphanic moment at which um, the individual whose name is going to escape my memory actually happens upon the theory. Um, and then I see it all together in one pure thought bite. The quantity theory of insanity shows its face to me. I suppose all people who look for the first time upon some new large scale explanatory theory must feel as I did at that moment with one surge of tremendous arrogance of aching hubris aching hubris. I felt as if I were looking at the very form of whatever purpose, whatever explanation there really is inherent in the very stuff on this earth, the earth, this earth, this life life, Christ alive. What if, I thought to myself, what if there is only a fixed proportion of sanity available in every, any given society at any given time? No previous theory of abnormal psychology had ever assumed such a societal dimension. For years I had sought some hypothesis to cement the individual psyche to the group. It was right in front of me all the time. But I went on, I elaborated, I filled out the theory, or rather, it filled out itself. It fizzed and took on form the way a paper flower expands in water. What if, I further thought, any attempt 
to palliate manifestations of insanity in one sector of society can only result in their upsurge in some other area of society. So that was it. The surface of the collective psyche was like the worn, stripy ticking of an, of an old mattress. If you pinched into its, uh, punched into its coiled hide at any moment, another part would spring up. There was no action without reaction, no laughter without tears, no normality without its pissing accompanist. The sodding crescent at the edge of my long since dunked digestive biscuit flotched to the desktop like excrement. Um, now, we're not great fans of similes on this channel, but that was a, that was a pretty good one, that last one, wasn't it? Um, so yes, and of course, the, the obvious uh, thematic corollaries of that are um, of societal planning. So you could imagine some, uh, 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 some faceless, indescribably nefarious organisation that, that, that would like to run the world um, could easily see to it that the upper and middle classes were jolly well fine, provided that they sought to always make the lower rungs uh, insane. Um, and, and you have this on a microcosmic level. He later he becomes disgusted with his own theory and he goes into... Um, he In order to flesh the theory out and to legitimise it, he works with about four or five um, psychological p academic peers and um, they all... They all jump on the bandwagon and um, make, you know, dine out on the fact that they were in some way connected with the quantity theory of insanity. And um, whilst going to one of his colleagues later hostels, he finds that he is running a campaign whereby um, if you have a, a kind of deranged mother um, and you're a son looking to help out that deranged mother, all of a sudden you can just go in there and um, they can be palliated and you can, as it were, sort of take on or in inherit that insanity. It's a very, very pregnant theory and um, obviously is um, indicative of Self's ingenuity, invention and his, um, yeah, his, his, his peculiar and irresistible thought processes and um, I'm going to say guile, G-U-I-L-E. Um, so yes, I, I hope I've done him justice. Um, you absolutely should pick up absolutely anything that I think I've written every, I've read rather every printed word that Self has, has, has uh, had published. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm never disappointed. I, I, it's been a while since I've read his fiction. Um, I'm usually reading his non-fiction in The New European where he talks about everything from um, trading relations to tree bark and um yeah it's it's, it's ceaselessly exciting um so yeah it, 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 it's obviously it's a hearty recommendation and um next up i think uh, i may as well say for our continued event summer in sport i'm going to read the um the biography the joint biography from dominic midgley and chris hutchins of um roman abramovich who is the fallen but um uh, you know bloodied but unbowed uh former uh former uh, administrator slash head slash owner of um, my favourite team, Chelsea Association Football Club, um, through his inextricable links with Vladimir Putin, was was um, nudged out of Western society. But 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 I'll, I'll get into that into another video. I've gone on for far too long and I need to go and have some more water and some lunch. Um, and then I'll get on to reading that and I'll write something for either for my Substack or a short story this afternoon. But uh, yes, I am babbling on uh, without reason. So I am, of course, going to thank you ever so much for watching BookTube and say goodbye.